Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I suggest we begin. We're still waiting for some people to join us. The commission will join us later on. And then some people will be joining us remotely. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We are very pleased to be hosting you here today. Firstly, I wanted to congratulate the Lookdown movement and the young activists who have come from all over Europe and who have just organised a great protest in front of the Parliament. There were many of you present, many citizens protesting in front of the Parliament, and I think that we need you. So continue your work. We can make progress. Your commitment is essential when it comes to the discussion that we will be having today relating to deep sea mining. We're going to look at what science has to say about the impact of these activities on oceans, international uh, negotiations that are ongoing, and we are very pleased to have some heads of uh, state, or rather representatives of French, German and Spanish governments and European representatives as well as scientists and representatives from NGOs. So I'm going to be the moderator, and we are going to have Marie Toussaint, who should be arriving shortly. So Marie Toussaint is on her way. She's currently at a negotiation. She will conclude uh, the debate and will also moderate the question and answer session. Now, when it comes to interpreting, Today we have interpreting in English, French and Spanish. So you've got your headsets and uh, with the buttons you can choose which interpretation channel you want to listen to. So thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to thank the Sirica Intergroup who have helped us organise this meeting. And thank you to the Sea at Risk NGO and Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Thank you for joining us today. So we are going to talk about deep seas. As it was said earlier, these are relatively unknown. I heard someone say earlier that we know less about them than the surface of the moon. And we know that they are overflowing with critical uh, raw materials, uh, minerals and metals. But in the short term, we know that there are some states and companies who are wanting to exploit these zones, which are uh, essential for the good functioning of the climate. Scientists have issued warnings um, regarding the loss of biodiversity, the irreversible damage on ecosystems, the disturbance of carbon sequestration in deep seas, an impact on activities relating to food security in coastal communities. One example is I'm in the fisheries committee, and this can have negative impacts on fishing and species such as tuna. We said earlier, and we only have a few months left to act, but if a moratorium is not adopted within the International Seabed Authority over the next few months, then the first... Uh, deep sea mining permits might be issued. Um, so the International Seabed Authority, what is it? It is an autonomous intergovernmental organisation that regulates activities related to deep seabed mineral resources in international waters. So the ISA is currently drafting a mining code to regulate these practices, which should, should be completed by July 2023, as I just said. So the negotiations are ongoing, but um, I, I quite like to run, but these negotiations are running quite slowly, unfortunately. Um, for many of us, um, it, we must absolutely... Um, um, ban this deep sea mining. Then there's the mining company, the metals company, which has obtained an exploration permit that authorizes it to extract 36,000 tons of metals in the Pacific. A video was leaked, and in this video, we can see them throwing out 
um, heavy metal waste straight into the Pacific. So we can see that we must act as quickly as possible. The civil society of the whole world is mobilising. And if once again we look at the example of France, there is a civil society group that has been mobilising for months now. Um, and they have said that this deep sea mining is um, a threat and their work has actually uh, worked because France at COP27 said that they are in favour of a total ban on deep sea mining. So we need to continue putting pressure on member states, continue mobilising. Another example of successful mobilisation is Canada. They recently also took a stand. On our side, good evening. In June 2022, at the Lisbon Ocean Summit, together with Marie Toussaint and the Vanuatu parliamentarian Ralph Regan Vanu, we launched a global parliamentary declaration for a moratorium on deep sea mining. We collected more than 250 signatures from more than 51 different countries. So we can see that things are gaining ground in France, we have a coalition of elected officials um, led by Nicolas Thierry, who adopted a resolution calling for a moratorium on deep sea mining. And the European Parliament is also opposed. So three times now they have voted in favour of a moratorium on deep sea bed mining. And this has been a great victory for the European Parliament to have these three votes under their belt or ready under its belt rather. So amongst us today we have representatives from member states who are in favour of a moratorium or a precautionary pause on deep sea mining. And then we have the European Commission here with us who have taken a stance, a very strong stance, um, on opting for a moratorium moratorium. So the EU can play a key role within the ISA and it is with the ecological transition that we can see that um, more and more uh, raw materials and minerals are going to be needed. Uh, if we look at electric vehicle batteries there is a call for reusing or recycling these materials but we need to put in place the conditions for a real circular economy that is socially just and respects living species so there is a question does the ecological transition have to um, occur at the price of at the cost of our environment well the answer is no we are defending the fact that you know we cannot continue like this and according to the European Parliament we believe that we need to establish a ban on deep sea mining. At the ISA we want to push for a moratorium on deep seabed mining as this Parliament has requested. I don't want to take up too much of your time speaking because I want to give our speakers here to uh, take the floor. But we have the pleasure of welcoming several speakers here who are with me up here. We have Patricia Esqueta, a doctor in marine biology or a marine biologist. We have Hugo Moran, Spanish Secretary of State for the Environment. Francisca Brantner, German Parliamentary State Secretary to the Federal Minister of Economics and Climate Protection. Uh, joining us remotely. We have Ketukis Sadoska, DG, Director General from DG Mare. We have Olivier Poivre d'Arvor, French Ambassador for the Poles and Maritime Issues, also joining us remotely. Unfortunately, he's going to have to leave us early. And then we have Dr. Monica Verbeek, Director of the Association Seas at Risk, who has helped co-organise this event. I suggest that we give the floor to Patrice, Patrice, Patricia Esquete to speak for five minutes. Do you have a PowerPoint? Please, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much for inviting me to this very important event. 
So let's talk about deep sea ecosystems. Next slide, please. Um, the deep sea holds ex an extraordinary variety of habitats and extremely high biodiversity. This biodiversity is driven by adaptations of the marine, um, is by adaptation of, um, by adaptation of the organisms to the extreme conditions that occur in the deep ocean. Extreme conditions of temperature, of pressure, lack of light, extreme conditions of chemistry, and also uh, scarce nutrients. At what we know from land and coastal ecosystems, in terms of restoration, of conservation, is not applicable to the deep ocean, precisely because um, the adaptations are different. But, uh, next slide, please. But the deep ocean is not only all about very interesting ecosystem and species, the deep ocean also plays a very important role. It has fundamental ecosystem services that are um, paramount for the life on Earth, such as climate regulation, uh, genetic resources. We need to understand the deep ocean as a huge library with genetic information that is not only important, that has a huge potential for pharmaceuticals, industrial agents, and biomaterials, but also, but also for understanding life itself. Also, food resources, fisheries, and habitat and trophic support for those uh, resources and along, etc. Next one. So there are three types of mineral resources in the deep sea: polymetallic nodules, ferromanganese, cobalt-rich crust in seamounts, and massive, sul massive sulfides in hydrothermal vents. Next. But we are going to focus on the nodule ecosystems because they are right now in the eye of the hurricane, for so to say. Nodule ecosystem supports a highly diverse fauna of sessile and mobile species. And we need to understand that the faunas that live in and depend of, on nodules cannot be found anybody else. They depend on the, on the nodules, not only the fauna, but also the microbiota. The faunal communities and the environmental parameters show high, vari high variability in local spatial scale. And that is important for conservation because what we know from one area can be completely not valid in the adjacent area. Next. So what are the impacts of polymetallic nodule mining? First of all, the removal of the nodules and the bioactive layer, that is the first layer of sediment where, where most of the biological processes happen. Um, also suspension of sediment plume. A plume is like a cloud of sediment that travels with the currents and the redeposition of blanket in the seafloor, discharge of sediment waste from surface, platform, and the rusher pipe, and also noise and light. That will cause loss of habitat, loss of species and genetic diversity, loss of ecosystem structure and functions, and consequently, the ecosystem services, and a change of characteristics and processes. And that will hinder uh, recovery. Next one. So according to the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, measure should be, measures should be taken in order to protect the marine environment from harmful effects of activities in the area. And how can that be achieved? Next. So there are protection and management tools like special planning, marine, marine protected areas, um, regional environmental management plans, environmental impact assessment before the activity and monitoring during and after the activity. All those protection and management tools need to be based in previous scientific information. Next, information on parameters like environmental conditions, biodiversity, their natural variability, processes like connectivity, life histories, trophic relationships, and also the resilience of all, of, all, of all that parameters uh, to the impacts. Next, please. And here's the problem. We don't know that much. Uh, in a recent study carried out by a group of scientists together with um, policymakers and lawyers showed that only 1% of the scientific topics assessed across regions and resources covered by mineral exploration contracts had sufficient information to enable evidence-based management of deep seabed mining. 
So 1% is not that much. Next, please. There's ongoing science in the framework, framework of um, European uh, funded projects such as Mining Impact 1 and 2 and Deep Rest uh, addressing all these topics. Next. And I'm going to share with you some of the results. Uh, decades of uh, study of uh, disturbance of the seabed, seabed sediments Mm. led to the conclusion that the loss of seafloor integrity by nodule and seafloor removal reduces population densities and alters ecosystem functions. For instance, the epifauna and abundance will be severely, de severely depleted and there will be no recovery after several decades. Next. Also, there is bio a reduction of bio bio biogeochemical activity, organic matter degradation, respiration, and microbial secondary production will be reduced, and the benthic food well altered, and the benthic food well is altered and not recovered decades after the disturbance. Next, please. An, independ an independent scientific research on the impact of a nodule collector trial in the framework of the project Mining Impact. Uh, allowed to study directly the, the effects of the collector tracks and the sediment plume dispersal. Next one, please. The plume deposition area was several times larger than the test area. There was a removal for up to eight centimeters of surface sediment and a redeposition of up to three centimeters inside the tracks and in the vicinity. And also the plume was transported up to four kilometers in low concentrations with the bottom currents. Next, please. There was an immediate impact related changes in environmental conditions. Biogeochemical bio and environmental variables were clearly affected by the impact. Next, please. And also there was a release of metals in the sediment plume. These metals were, are bioavailable. That means that they are assimilable by living organisms. Next one, please. So what are, what are the implications for conservations? Next, we need to understand that the nodule biota and associated processes will never recover. This is a permanent impact. What will be left, next one please. What will be left is, a, is an altered sediment with a slow recovery of sediment of bio, sediment bio, biogeochemistry and associated biota, including species extinctions. That could last for at least decades, maybe hundreds of years, and species extinction, of course, is a permanent uh, impact. Next one, and next one. The effects of the plume on the sediment and nodule fauna are still far from being understood, as well as other impacts like bio biogeochemistry, microbiota, and even less understood what the effects on the water column. Next, please. Whether a recovery, the previous one, <laughs> whether there will be a full recovery or an alternative stable state with a clear loss of biodiversity, it will still to be understood. Also, that loss is quite likely. Next one, and last one. So to finalize, coming back to the beginning, uh, in order to ensure the effective protection of marine ecosystem, we need protection and man management tools, but also it's important to define threshold for the impacts, which needs to be supported by global science. Uh, needless to say, scientific approaches like this take time. And I'm going to leave you with that reflection. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Patricia. Thank you very much, Patricia. Yes, uh, when you see what you have presented to us, we realize that we must take account of the scientific guidance that's out there that's very important. I'm going to hand over now to Hugo Moreau, please. You have around seven minutes. Thank you very much. Firstly, I'd like to 
Uh, thank you for those who are spending time, devoting time to this task, which is uh, useful to us to understand the uh, responsibility that we must shoulder uh, towards the future. For thousands of years, the oceans and seas have been a source of food and resources and a strategic way of life. Uh, it has uh, very important to the development and the well-being of our society. But at the moment, ecosystems are under significant threats. We have the same problem for uh, Spanish waters, which means that we have to undertake uh, marine management plans that con uh, contribute to the conservation of biodiversity. Um, this is a tool that, uh, for conservation that is very valuable, but the uh, Spanish experience uh, shows that it isn't enough just to increase the percentage of surfaces under protection. It is very important that beyond these protected areas, in the rest, in the rest of the territory, we must take account of uh, biodiversity conservation, which means that the it means the incorporation of biodiversity in uh, forestry. Uh, agriculture, mining, tourism, and consistent um, policies uh, whereby no significant damage is caused. The establishing of synergies and uh, uh, international agreements and global local processes are uh, an important framework which makes our voice heard and um, we can be heard. Um, and supported the uh, implementation of, of uh, international agreements and the arm harmonization of our own tools with uh, uh, global tools. And uh, we uh, have to be uh, in line with the uh, regulation under discussion. And it is important uh, that we have this so that we can inc um, secure a high level of environmental protection. All of these are valuable lessons that we must apply when it comes to marine conservation. We are uh, in a very decisive decade for the uh, protection of biodiversity. And we have to establish effective safeguards and uh, anticipate to this end in order to protect uh, marine ecosystems. Firstly, we must act firmly against anything that endangers biodiversity. Climate change, pollution, or the over-exploitation of resources. This uh, work of uh, dovetailing different policies will uh, create uh, policies that will generate global solutions to current problems. Um, Spain wants to be a trailblazer uh, um, as the protector of uh, uh, the marine environment. And it's important uh, that uh, we have that. Our position is the same at a national, European, and multilateral level. And the protection of oceans is a question of national interests. Uh, and it is about uh, committing to protecting global goods. And in order to do that, we have established the 3030 as a national objective. And in 2022, we undertook the uh, objective of 25% uh, of uh, marine protected species. We participate in proactively in the uh, regional conventions, OSPAN, Barcelona. We He's cutting out. Is he? Yes. And unido a la High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People. We have a coalition nature for people. Apparently, there's a problem with the speaker's microphone. Oops. Oh. <laughs> so I was saying that together with the High Ambition Coalition for Nature and People and Global Oceans Alliance, we have been actively working on a global framework for 2030 approved in the recent conference at the Convention on 
um, biological is to achieve the protection of 30% of marine territories by 2030. We are trying to be more ambitious in protecting biodiversity beyond territorial waters and protecting um, the environment in international waters. When it comes to ongoing negotiations and ending uh, deep sea mining under the framework of um, deep seas, we are asking for a precautionary pause when it comes to the deep sea mining because this is part of um, human um, heritage. We also need to develop um, environmental protection measures. We need to look at environmental impact indicators, look at monitoring and surveillance inspections, um, any activity that could jeopardize the uh, ecosystem of these um, seas and that could also jeopardize biodiversity. This focus has already been put forward by the Parliament um, in its resolution uh, from June. They launched a call to all member states to promote a moratorium on deep sea mining as uh, until enough studies have been carried out on the effects of deep sea mining on biodiversity and human activities in seas. And until this management uh, can be done to ensure that biodiversity uh, is not jeopardized and ecosystems are not degraded. As you all know, Spain um, has a vote and we are going to work on fulfilling this principle of precaution. We want a precautionary pause on mining in high seas. No mining can occur until there is sufficient scientific knowledge and environmental safeguards that are effective to prevent irreversible damage on sea biodiversity and the health of oceans and seas. We need to invest in scientific research, development and basic tools to improve our knowledge of seas. And we also need to work on international cooperation with um, ocean um, research uh, bodies. We are going to have a decade of uh, scientific knowledge which will start shortly. We need a more inclusive and transparent process uh, using all the tools that we have at hand, from access to scientific data on exploration. We need to establish guidelines, carry out environmental uh, impact assessments and negotiations within uh, the ISA. We need to look at technical uh, bodies, develop standards and collaborate. We must guarantee that these environmental impact measures be collaborative and precautionary. And they must be done in a manner that is transparent, exhaustive, um, and can ensure that changes be made to avoid uh, damage is being caused to uh, seas. We need to fulfill environmental indicators on the state of ecosystems and deep seas so that we avoid um, significant harm and establish a fair distribution of benefits and ensure that any income that is made from these activities be uh, fairly distributed um, to ensure the development of the transfer of technology and skills uh, using... Uh, I, I would like to conclude by saying that the precautionary principle became a key concept in international agreements as of 1999. We need to translate this into um, processes that we have seen in the UN uh, law of the sea because we must ensure the protection of oceans um, because this is also uh, the future of our survival. We must... Um, we have a relationship with the sea, which has been uh, a relationship of extraction, but this needs to change. We must, we now have a blank page and let us write on it um, and be thoughtful about what we are going to write. Thank you.
Merci. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm going to uh, give the floor to Francisca Brantner. Can you hear us properly? Yes, we can hear you properly. Can you hear me? Yes, I'll hand over the floor to you for around seven minutes. Uh, I'll speak in English if that's okay. Yes, there's interpretation. First of all, thank you very much for um, inviting me. And I could almost say I stopped my intervention because Hugo Martin already said everything that I very much agree with. Um, but I'm still going to add a few sentences if you allow me. Um, I'm a parliamentary state secretary in the Ministry of Economy and Climate Action in Germany, and I'm also in charge of raw materials and circular economy in getting more resilient and sustainable in the raw material supply uh, for our green transition and digital transformation. Um, so in that sense, I'm looking, of course, as well at the issue uh, from the raw material angle. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, from the beginning, we cannot say we don't even look at uh, what options there are. But at the same time, we cannot close our eyes uh, to the potential dangers that deep sea mining um, could have. Um, and I think that, you know, we see in every single uh, experiment and every single um, uh, you know, diving in there that we d discover uh, new uh, species that have not even been identified before and that we d really do not know the entire ecosystem um, or we don't know really a lot. We just know very, very little. Um, so we have very little good analysis uh, and scientific research on the potential consequences. We have just heard on the plumes, on the, you know, the sediment, um, on the consequence of light, of the sound. Uh, we just have very little knowledge there. And it's hard to say these days what the consequences really are. And of course, that is key for us to know better. Um, and that's why we as the German government have joined others, the French, the Spanish and others, in the current negotiations uh, in the International Seabed uh, Authority on a precautionary pause. We are among those who are calling for a precautionary pause and say we need to make, you know, hold now and um, and we need to uh, make sure that we know really what we are about to do. And we do not support deep sea bed mining unless we really have reliant, um, good information about um, the consequences and that we can exclude really serious harm to the environment. Um, so we think that you know we should not stop there we we really have to find out more uh, to close the scientific gaps we have there and the german government is financing um the scientific research on the deep sea and at the poles uh, at an annual level of 400 million euros um and most of that goes really into uh, scientific exploration of the deep sea. Um, so for us, it's important that we learn more and that we um, are in that sense really also, uh, you know, adding to the knowledge uh, that internationally is um, procured by many actors, but also we and our German teams mainly work in international corporations. It's rarely a purely German endeavor. Um, but as you know, the two years rule um, of the International Seabed Agreement is allowing that starting this summer, um, there could be first uh, applications for a commercial deep seabed mining. Um, and and it, it is really tends to see, you know, how we can, um, you know, take now actions in the scenario with the other members of the International Seabed Authority. And I think, you know, that we really have to make sure that we do not walk, sleepwalk into the scenario. It's, um, you know, the summer is coming very soon. And that we have to make sure that there is enough awareness and uh, about what could happen. Um, and that we have to, uh, you know, build good and strong alliances that hold. Um, 
So, um, and in parallel, of course, we're also part of the negotiation process on on the rules um, of deep sea mining, um, because we should also not leave that to those who do not care about the environment. Um, and this complexity in this international law area of law is is really is really quite high, um, because it's really very specific, high environmental standards. There are institutional questions, trade. Um, accountability questions about who pays for the licenses, uh, who is, um, you know, how do you establish a mechanism of compliance and enforcement. So there are so many questions. Um, and at the same time, as we say, you know, we want a precautionary pause. We don't want to leave these negotiations to those who do not care about the environment. Um, and this is all in the setting, of course, uh, where there are many interests and much money potentially involved. Um, and our approach is to have the precautionary principle applied so that you really um, have to show and prove that deep sea mining is not harming the environment um, before you can even start with it. Um, so it's a very complex uh, and challenging task. It's a task where we have to form international alliances the European Union is certainly a good starting point. We have to go beyond. Um, and the news from last weekend, I think, were really good to see that there is an international support for the protection of the deep sea. Um, and that we have to apply what was decided last week also to this area. But I think time is running and we have to make sure we build strong alliances. And Germany is key in that. Uh, we have aligned with France, with others in making this one of our also priorities on the German-French cooperation. And I'm proud to say that uh, our Minister of Environment is very also involved on this. Even though our ministry is um, key and uh, the lead on deep sea mining. Um, and I'm very glad that we are in a coalition and can work together with you in the parliament, with the Spanish colleagues, the French, the Portuguese, etc. Um, and I think together we will manage to protect our deep sea. Thank you so much. Merci Thank you very much, Francisca. What I suggest we do now is um, Mr. Poivre d'Arvor is no, not online yet, so what I suggest we do is uh, hand over to Mrs. Sadoskas for around seven minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'll be switching to English if that's all right with you. So, well, good evening and uh, thanks a lot for organizing this round table for bringing this uh, um, young and enthusiastic audience, a uh, variety of the people who care about the oceans, care about the future, because that's that's precisely the mindset with which we have to also approach the topic that um, is being discussed today. And this is also rather timely because um, uh, the 28th session of the International Seabed Authority Council is approaching. In fact, it's starting in two days. And uh, this will be essential, crucial discussions uh, on the negotiation, regulations, and exploitations and, uh, uh, of the mineral resources in the area. Uh, the current negotiations on uh, deep sea mining are a unique opportunity uh, to regulate activity before it takes place. And the European Commission has been following these talks very closely with very close attention. In 2019, we have adopted the Green Deal. You may remember that. We still uh, are guided by, by this deal. And it recognizes that the environmental ambition will not be achieved by Europe acting alone. And since the drivers of climate change and biodiversity loss are global and not limited to national borders, we have to act globally. The European Union is committed to lead international efforts, use its influence, expertise, financial resources, science, uh, societal mobilization to, uh, to, to mobilize its partners to join on a sustainable path. To stop the biodiversity loss, uh, Europe has adopted uh, the 2030 biodiversity strategy, an ambitious long-term plan to protect nature and reverse the degradation of ecosystems, including the marine ones. 
this strategy stresses that in line with the precautionary principle, more research and knowledge is needed on the effects and potential risks of international deep sea mining on the marine environment, biodiversity, and human activities. And European Union calls for advanced knowledge and better technologies and operational practices able to demonstrate no harm to environment before marine minerals in international seabed area are exploited. Considering the latest developments at the International Seabed Authority on the draft regulations on the exploitation of marine minerals in the area, as well as the broad consensus among the scientific community uh, that knowledge related to deep sea uh, environment and mine impacts is still far from sufficient uh, to enable evidence-based decision-making, which would allow sustainable exploitation and that's why European Commission has decided to confirm the position from biodiversity strategy and to strengthen it in the International Ocean Governance Agenda, which it updated last year in June. In this agenda, we advocate for prohibiting deep sea mining until these scientific gaps are properly filled or at least closed um, uh, satisfactorily and that it can be demonstrated that no harmful effects arise from mining and, as required by the Convention of the Law of the Seas, the necessary provisions in the exploitation of regulations for the effective protection of marine environment are in place. The European Parliament, in October uh, last year, reiterated, reiterated, reiterated this call uh, on the Commission on the member states to support the international moratorium on deep sea uh, deep seabed mining in its resolution on momentum for the ocean and the strengthening um, uh, ocean governance and biodiversity and last december the council adopted its conclusions on international ocean governance where two paragraphs are dedicated to deep sea mining and the work of international seabed authority the council did not call for moratorium but for a sound regulatory regime based on precaution. There is a difference if you look and listen carefully. We welcome the current discussions at the International Seabed Authority for numerous delegations, raising the crucial issue of the protection of the environment. As consensus is growing about the necessity to have a robust regulatory framework with high environmental standards in place before mining can take place, it is therefore time to, uh, to take a moment and not rush the finalization of the draft exploitation regulations. Improving the knowledge of seabed ecosystems in the area is of paramount importance for the successful implementation of EU political priorities because it is, necessary, uh, is a necessary step to establish a solid baseline for the protection of these ecosystems. And that's why European Commission has funded for a number of years, several projects um, which aim at identifying and mitigating the impacts of deep sea, uh, deep sea bed binding to the marine environment. Uh, we are cooperating with the International Seabed Authority, notably through EU sponsored projects on the Atlantic Regional Environmental Management Plan, which produced solid, very interesting scientific foundation for the development of, um, this, um, uh, of this plan uh, for the area in the northern mid-Atlantic ridge. It's a small part of the ocean, but still pretty emblematic and very important to protect. The Commission is also part of the Sustainable Seabed Knowledge Initiative, which will provide a very important contribution to the knowledge of the sea biodiversity and ecosystems. And Sustainable Seabed Knowledge Initiative seeks to fill the gaps in the knowledge of uh, seabed ecosystems, their connectivity and interrelationship between the endemism of species um, and conglomeration of seabed minerals. Uh, the scientific effort is fully in line with EU's science-based approach to environmental protection with precautionary principle, principle and with EU's entire poli policy framework. 
Uh, this initiative is, is timely, necessary, um, uh, to which European Commission is really a proud contributor, and we believe that it will contribute to implementation of the post-2020 global biodiversity framework through enhancing knowledge on deep sea biodiversity. And the last point I'd like to make is, of course, to reiterate and rejoice the, the progress that we've managed um, but two nights ago, two days ago, on, on uh, biodiversity or protection of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, because that is the momentum that will certainly <clears throat> trigger mindsets and hopefully positions of different countries, companies, all the stakeholders there, because it shows that there is a care, there is an interest to look after the areas which so far have been falling between the legal cracks <clears throat> and legal vacuum. And uh, we really hope that we'll manage to also get sufficient ratification for the entry of this new wonderful treaty, which will also be very, very important for what we do on the seabed. Thank you. Merci. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I see that uh, Olivier Poivre d'Arbor is online. I hope you can hear us, hear us. I suggest you take the floor now. You have around seven minutes. I hear you. I'd like to thank you. I have heard you very attentively up to now. And I was very happy because I came back from New York yesterday and I took part in the negotiations for the European Union uh, on the agreement for the PPNG. And I said that uh, we were quite isolated, very isolated a year ago. We were right, because how could we justify um, to our generation, to the rest of the world, to our children that um, during COP the COP15 in Montreal, we all, the international um, uh, community, uh, undertook to protect biodiversity with the 30% uh, of uh, protection of uh, land and seas by 2030. How could we have justified, um, after 15 years, after 15 years of discussions, we finally have an agreement on the protection of uh, deep sea uh, biodiversity. How could we, international community, in a multilateral uh, setting of the UN, in Kingston in July, uh, in the framework of the International Authority of the Deep uh, Sea. Uh, how can we justify going for resources at the bottom of uh, the ocean? This would be unjustified, not only at a scientific level, but also vis-à-vis um, -vis civil society, NGOs, and uh, unjustified via our uh, offspring. And uh, after lengthy uh, thinking, and we were able to get, uh, uh, we were able to get, uh, there was per permits for exploration, and the President of the Republic uh, at Lisbon, uh, um, at the conference there, and at Sherman Czech, he reasserted his perhaps quite extreme uh, uh, request. We have uh, an exclusive to our economic zone representing 10 million uh, square kilometers. Um, we have this ban on deep sea mining. Uh, this is a d political decision and we're, uh, it is an extreme uh, one and we're going to uh, join a coalition uh, around the precautionary principle. Uh, or that of the moratorium. What is as a stake today, and uh, that what we that is what we have tried to do at our scale um, in Montreal and Panama. Uh, we wanted to re create a coalition uh, um, for a moratorium or a precautionary principle. 
I'm not going to list um, the countries, but we have uh, the support uh, from uh, uh, Germany. We have uh, Germany, Italy, Spain. I hope that uh, Belgium and the Netherlands will be joining us uh, shortly. And we also have numerous countries, uh, Palau, Vanuatu, New Zealand in the Pacific, and uh, countries from uh, Latin America, such as Chile, Costa Rica, and Panama, and other countries. Uh, that will join our coalition in the next few days. We have a, a discussion that is taking place on the 15th of March on, at the IFM and from the 24th of July at the Assembly will give us the opportunity to see to it uh, that uh, no mining code is adopted this year, even if we have to wait until the 2025 uh, conference uh, in Nice, hosted by France and Costa Rica, we will wait. And apart from the time it'll take to adopt a mining code, it'll take a great many years before scientists can provide the proof that uh, the environmental impact is not a disastrous one. Uh, in conclusion now, after having announced this uh, ban on deep-sea uh, mining, the uh, economic and industrial uh, world in France did not really react uh, as if they it would uh, appear they weren't ready for this deep sea mining. I, everybody seems to be happy about this ban. And in the next few years, with the help and support of science, we might envisage um, mining um, in the ocean what we need. But it is too early days now. Thank you very much. Merci. Uh... Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank the interpreters. I know it's complicated. Um, Mr. Poivre d'Avor had a technical problem. Um, and thank you for having interpreted uh, um, him without uh, being able to see him. No problem at all. Monica Verbecke, the uh, floor is yours for around seven minutes. Thank you very much. And thanks to Sierrica and uh, Marie Toussaint and Caroline Rose for organizing and hosting this. Thank you very much. It's very timely uh, to talk now about uh, deep sea mining. So good that you're all here. Um, Seas at Risk um, has today uh, released our latest publication. It's a policy brief on the unsustainability of deep sea mining and how it compromises various uh, sustainable development uh, goals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you can find uh, printed copies in the room here or otherwise online um, on our website of Seas at Risk. Uh, what we've already heard from all the speakers is that deep sea mining will evidently have a negative impact on SCG 14, uh, life below water. It will bring about a large scale irreversible biodiversity loss. Um, but this brief shows how deep sea mining is at odds with many of the other uh, SDGs. Uh, just to mention one, it compromises SDG 13, climate action, as we also heard outside of the par parliament this afternoon, because it interferes with the planet's uh, carbon pump. It disturbs hydrothermal vents that play a key role in regulating climate and um, ocean geochemistry. And it also affects carbon fixing organisms. Another relevant SDG is SDG, SDG 16, Strong Institutions, because as we heard, deep sea mining in the high seas is regulated by the International Seabed Authority, a UN body, which has already approved over 1.3 million square kilometers uh, for deep sea mining exploration. So that's an area larger than India. And as we heard from Patricia, um, uh, mining that area would be having an impact on even a much wider um, area. Regulations for deep sea mining are currently being negotiated, as we heard, uh, but due to an obscure so-called two-year rule, uh, mining operations can already start this year uh, with or without regulations. And in addition, there are many problems with the governance of the ISA, including a lack of transparency, lack of environmental competence, and many more issues which you can see in our report. But it's important also to realize uh, that the core mission of the ISA is not only regulating seabed mining, 
uh, but it is also and foremost protecting the deep seabed from harmful effects of activities. And as we just heard from all the previous uh, speakers, our current scientific knowledge shows that deep sea mining will inevitably cause irreversible harm to the deep sea ecosystems. Now, with the treaty just agreed a few days ago, two nights ago, um, there is now a framework for the protection of marine ecosystems in the high seas. So clearly now the ISA needs to totally focus on that protection role that they also have. Currently, the ISA is not fit for purpose and it really needs a deep institutional reform. Uh, our report brings also more uh, examples of SDGs uh, at odds with deep sea mining. But just to summarize, deep sea mining is unsustainable. So why do it? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, transition to re renewable energy, shift to electric cars, acceleration of digitalization, all these things will need vast amounts of metals and minerals. And the mining industry is therefore now looking further, looking beyond venturing out to new frontiers. But already in 2016, a study from the University of Sydney showed that there is a transition to 100% renewable energy supply possible without deep sea mining. So rather than destroying the planet's last frontier for finite resources, we should reduce our demand for raw materials. And there's many possibilities to do this. We can enhance urban mining, uh, invest in shared economy models, uh, promote a circular economy, change the way we produce and consume, promote innovations uh, for technology of recycling and batteries. Uh, according to uh, UNEP's International Resource Panel, policies for resource efficiency and sustainable production and consumption could see metal extraction increase by only 12% by 2060, instead of doubling it, as that would be the case if we would just continue with business as usual. And the EU has a very big responsibility here, because we all use up 20% of global mineral production for less than 10% of the world's population. So, deep sea mining is unsustainable, we don't want it, we don't need it, and it's not worth the risk. And next slide, please. We are now at a moment regarding deep sea mining that actually resembles where the international community was in the late 80s, in 1980s, that is, <laughs> when the possibility of mining in Antarctica seemed imminent. In 1988, a convention was signed that would uh, allow mining in Antarctica go ahead. But a few states refused to sign it, started to work on an alternative, a new agreement to protect Antarctica. And just three years later, in 1991, the Madrid Protocol was signed, effectively banning mining in Antarctica. Now, next slide, please. A year ago, no single country in the world was publicly defending a moratorium or a ban or a precautionary pose. But now, at the start of deep sea mining seemed imminent, with a two-year-old triggered and with equipment being tested, and this possibility that deep sea mining starts in international or in national waters is still a very real threat. But in just eight months, 13 states have now announced their support for either a moratorium, precautionary pose, or a ban of deep sea mining. And so we applaud Spain, France, and Germany to be part of this group of leaders. But now, of course, we need more. Uh, next slide, please. We need more states to follow. So I'm very happy to hear now that there's a coalition in the making of countries, um, and their hope really that they can work their way through and that we'll get more states to follow. But it's also important that you, MEPs and other representatives that are here today, uh, bring the need for a moratorium of a, or a ban of deep sea mining to your constituencies and to your national legislators. Uh, as you can see on this map, there are deep sea metal deposits also in European waters and EU countries must set the example by prohibiting deep sea mining in European waters and continental shelves. Next slide, please. But there's more steps that the EU should take now on the road to a future without deep sea mining. In international waters, EU member states and the EU itself, there are members of the International Seabed Authority must become 
active advocates against deep sea mining in this critical year we have now. And they should publicly express their support for a moratorium, precautionary pause or ban. And they should prevent the granting of mining contracts this year during the key meetings of the ISA. And they should ensure that mining regulations are not adopted by the ISA until scientific uh, gaps are filled and risks properly assessed and understood. But not only the member states, also the Commission and the European Parliament have a role to play. Both institutions have been very supportive for a moratorium, but now they must show that they're serious about it and coherent in their policy making. And the first opportunity for this will already come next week, when the Commission will release the proposal for a Critical Raw Materials Act. And this act focuses on securing demand of raw materials under the current geopolitical circumstances. And it will allow for uh, strategic projects, strategic for the EU, to be fast-tracked and funded. But projects related to deep-sea mining must therefore be explicitly excluded. And in, and in addition, this act will be the framework for specific trade and sectoral regulations. And these should also include a ban on the import and the use of raw materials or manufactured goods that have been obtained from or produced with deep sea materials, uh, minerals. So in the light of the alternatives for deep sea mining that I just mentioned, in the light of demand reduction, the Critical Raw Material Act and other policy instruments should go beyond securing demand and set binding EU material footprint reduction targets. We need to reduce our consumption of raw materials. And we need to downscale the EU's economic consumption, shifting its priority from growth, economic growth, to meeting people's needs without overshooting Earth's ecological limits. And next slide, please. With that, I would like you with the thoughts of, again, mentioning deep sea mining. We don't want it. We don't need it. It's not worth the risk. If you want to know a bit more about deep sea mining, please check out our website. We have more reports on it. Thank you. Merci, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Marie Toussaint has arrived. As I said, she was at a negotiation. So I'm now going to give her the floor and we're going to have a question and answer session. And then Marie Toussaint will conclude. She will give some concluding remarks. So Marie, the, word, the floor is yours. Thank you, Caroline. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very sorry for being so late. I'm really sorry for missing uh, the presentations uh, that you gave. But I just wanted to thank you for coming all the way to Brussels. I was at some negotiations which have nothing to do with deep sea mining because it's a review of the Directive on Environmental Crimes, which might actually affect companies um, that deal with deep sea mining and maybe um, activities that we know are harmful for the planet and human beings across the world. So thank you very much. And once again, sorry for being late. We're now going to open the question and answer session. I can see some of you look a little tired, but others of you are looking slightly more awake. Do any of you have any questions? And whilst you think about your questions, um, don't forget to tell us um, a little bit about yourselves, where you come from. Right, I can see a hand over there, please. The floor is yours. Um, my name is Sanjo Mith. I'm from the European Marine Board um, Secretariat, and we represent 10,000 um, scientists around Europe. And actually, I have the question um, that maybe is a really fundamental question is that um, we're saying that moratorium and precautionary pause until uh, we know that deep sea mining doesn't cause any harm to the environment. But I just wonder, like, when will we know what, you know, when they will know that there is no harm? Because, um, you know, we don't know much about the deep sea. We, uh, many people refer to that. We know more about the moon and the Mars and Mars about that the deep sea. And also, for instance, uh, we don't know how even plants grow and you know we can culture them in labs and so on so um 
is it that the case that maybe we will never know enough? That's good uh, to for uh, for um, stopping deep sea mining. But I'm just wondering, like, when and how can we define when we know a lot? Because then I guess a lot of people will be willing to put like, okay, until now we know, so we can um, allow deep sea mining. So um, it's just a question for many people who pronounce that you know, no deep sea mining until there is no harm to the environment. Something also that Dr. Eskete also said that. Yeah, if you remove the um, models and nodules, uh, then you know you already destroy the habitat. So, do we want to know more? Just a question from the scientist perfect perspective. Thank you. Okay, so that's a question over: Shall we do a moratorium, and for how long, or should we ban deep sea mining totally? Right. Um, before giving the floor to the speakers, maybe we can take a second question. If someone has one in mind, great, Anna, go ahead. I'm going to speak in Spanish. Um, that way I can give the Spanish interpreters a bit of a break. My name is, my name is Anna Miranda. I'm an MEP from the Green Alliance Group. And I'd like to thank Caroline Rose for organising this event. It's very important, particularly because we can see that there's a lot of speculation on these resources and we're seeing severe problems regarding um, deep sea mining. So I'd like to congratulate this organization because the um, Galician Parliament was the first in Spain to launch an initiative that put forward a moratorium on deep sea mining. And it was unanimously approved by all groups. So this was a very important moment. We have a seabed that is very important but we also have marine resources and important uh, raw materials and these multinationals are very uh, greedy we have a mine which yesterday juan and i with other um, environmental collectives were in a city called noya where we were at a protest protesting against something that was authorised by the People's Party regarding a mine called San Fin. Greed is there. People want to exploit these resources. And so we were protesting. Uh, there were many environmental uh, groups and political parties who were there with us. And we wanted to clearly protest the fact that we are not colonies. These multinationals come with their macro projects, as we can see uh, with the threat of uh, uh, wind farms, which are threatening um, fisheries. Caroline and I uh, have already identified that as a threat, so that's another important issue. But unanimously, my group has launched an initiative that is calling on the Spanish government to... Um, promote a moratorium on deep sea mining until further uh, investigation and research has been done on its effects on human activities, uh, the sea, and also marine biodiversity. So we want a total ban. We don't think there will be one, but we want a total ban on these activities in territorial waters and in protected marine areas. Because this is only giving impunity to... Uh, this exploitation. So this is why we wanted to call on the European Commission in this regard. So we would like support for this initiative, this fight against deep sea mining and the effects on human activities, uh, seas and biodiversity. And so I'd like to thank Caroline for bringing together all these experts and thanking everyone for coming from across Europe to this meeting. Marie is everywhere. She was also at our conference on European maritime safety. She is there at all the support initi initiatives. We are joining you in the fight against deep sea mining everywhere in Europe. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you. 
to the speakers. I don't know, shall we do women first or no? <laughs> okay, then on the men's side, <laughs> I'm sorry, that's how you're set, right? So, no, but Mr. Moran, <laughs> do you want to? No, funciona este. Is this working? So to the first question that was asked relating to when will we have enough knowledge to take a decision with regards to whether we should exploit these marine resources and if it can be compatible with protecting biodiversity or not. If we were able to know this, then we'd be in a great position to uh, influence decisions. But as of yet, every day we are discovering new things. Uh, we're discovering new things about the human body. And it is very possible that we will never know everything to completely understand all the consequences of this form of exploitation. But having said that, the fact that we don't know enough about our own bodies doesn't mean doesn't hinder us from taking decisions on how to manage things in the world of medicine and treatment and managing illnesses. The knowledge that we have is uh, limited and so we are constantly obliged to incorporate management tools because, amongst other things, we have the responsibility to make life on this planet compatible with the expectations of development of the human species. So, yes, a lot of knowledge is lacking, but I think it is reasonable that we should be able to make efforts, as our other speakers have said, to um, investigate and make as much progress as we can in this, on, on this issue. We need to make the most of these resources but we need to have the right knowledge to know how to go about doing this so initiatives that have been adopted um, as the one mentioned earlier we want to anticipate the responses or uh, expectations that are going to continue growing in the future. And we mustn't, th there is no time to lose in uh, gathering all this knowledge and finding solution, management solutions that are reasonable. Gracias. Uh, it's muy aussi. Go ahead. Um, you're basically asking a moratorium or a ban. <clears throat> And um, we just heard more and more about scientific knowledge, where we first thought that nodules, if they would carefully be picked up, then perhaps um, impacts could be reduced. Meanwhile, we know nodules itself are fully ecosystems with very specific species that can't be found anywhere else. Hydrothermal vents, we know already that, that will, um, mining that will indeed no doubt have irreparable um, loss of biodiversity and even chances of releasing methane, uh, which is a very powerful uh, greenhouse gas. So I think for certain types of mining, it's absolutely clear that there's irreversible damage done. Um, and I don't think um, waiting and being precautious and trying to pick up nodules, uh, um, how, how do the miners say, um, hoover them up, um, will um, or collect them or harvest them, that's what they call it. Anyway, that that will um, be uh, sufficient because you are still destroying uh, full ecosystems that are uh, nowhere else to be found. So irreversible uh, loss of biodiversity. So if you ask me, I don't think we have to um, gather more knowledge to decide whether we should have a moratorium or a ban. It would be clearly a ban as far as I'm concerned. However, we should continue to investigate the deep sea because it is clear that uh, um, many incredible things are being uh, discovered every day about it. So. Yeah, I must continue. So if the, um, uh, 
I'm going to switch to Spanish, sorry. <laughs> it depends how much you want to protect. If you want to protect 100%, well, then um, it's impossible and that's it. <clears throat> In order to incorporate management tools, the first thing we have to do is to understand what is this biodiversity in order to do, know what can be lost, how it works, uh, how do these ecosystems work, to know how to protect these ecosystems. To uh, and understand this, do we need a lot of time? Do we need a lot of effort? That depends. That depends how much effort we are able to put into this whole thing. With a lot of effort, we would need at least 10 years. Those are the calculations. How much is enough? With enormous amounts of efforts, with a lot of uh, research groups and an awful lot of money, we'd need at least 10 months in order to start understanding how these ecosystems work. Thanks a lot. Mr. Saudaskas, do you want to add your comments to what's already been said? Uh, well, th this, this is a difficult discussion. I, I, I can't deny this. And so I think that the, the closer and deeper we look at, at the role of science in societal decision making, the more complicated it gets because the only thing that we know that science is sure about is, or let's say any research conclusion is sure about, is that more research is needed, always. There's never, ever a conclusive um, finding of science, ever. That's why when I was uh, speaking about uh, closing the scientific gap, uh, I, was, I was also attenuating a bit that message because they, there is a probability that we'll never know that we'll never know, just like it was given an example here, you know, we don't know much about the human bodies, you know, like the endocrine systems, we're just discovering how they function, just one example here, uh, let alone that we don't know much what happens in, uh, in, in, in the deep seas, uh, and the fact that we keep discovering each time we go down new species, which are very valuable, which could be very valuable, and that's precisely why uh, the genetic marine resources element in the BBNG negotiation was the most complicated of all for that for a good reason shows that there, there's never going to be an end to this and that's why indeed a societal and, and, and philosophical question and political question at the same time what do we do about this at the same time uh, le let me also say that you know and to make it probably even more complicated is is that uh, indeed, we have to uh, strive for the alternative which would not require the primary resource take. Um, and uh, and the, the best solution indeed is now to, um, to, to recover what we have already um, put in the, in the human sphere. Um, circular economy was mentioned here as one example. Uh, in fact, it's really one of the solutions and we have to roll it out a lot more forcefully, a lot more faster. At the same time, when you think what happens with you know, specific materials, and let's take example of cobalt, um, the one that, okay, is for now seen to be as a key element in the batteries, in the, in the energy accumulation. And we know that we, we need it, at least for now, and, until we have found other alternatives, is how do we recover it from what we already have? Because we know that we'll need a lot more batteries, and we're talking about the exponential growth of them. And there is not enough of the cobalt in the used batteries just yet. And we know it, because we'll need a lot more of that. The question is now... Do we, you know, do we uh, source it in, in, in Africa? We, we know it's, it's in the worst conditions possible. Do we go um, elsewhere looking for it? Do we try to recover it from the, from, the, uh, from the already economic cycles that we already have, which we know are not su sufficient? Or we look for alternatives which are cobalt-free, okay, which probably is the best one, and that's what drives innovation. While at the same time, we know that that will require something else. Okay, you go for less cobalt, you go for more nickel. You go for less nickel, you go for something else more, probably. And all that seems to be a vicious circle. So there is never a perfect solution for this. And that's why we need to look for something that is the most sustainable, the most, uh, 
let's say, the, I would say the least damaging because they know that there will always be a human impact on the environment, always. But, but we have to be sure that we act responsibly and we'll look for the least, least damaging one. I think that's, that's really the difficult question we have to pose to ourselves and admit that there will be a, 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 an impact there. But precisely for that reason, and b because of the mystery of the oceans, and we still don't know so much about it, and it's, there's so much value in it, Indeed, we are calling for the strongest possible um, safeguards before anything, anything starts. And the situation as it is right now, indeed, with all these eyeless procedures, two years, etc., is not good enough. It's not good enough because it's not going to, 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 uh, to, to protect the ocean uh, sufficiently. So we have to, we have to um, mobilize the coalition. The global coalition is not that strong yet. Even in European Union ourselves, you know, we need. We talk about handful of countries who have said this, but not, there is still not everybody who was so, so absolutely unequivocal. And now even within the member states themselves, there are different forces and different, different opinions about this. And when you look very carefully at, uh, at how we also try to position ourselves in the International Seabed Authority, and I think anybody who followed the discussion on the Council will see that we haven't got what we wanted. Uh, you know, the reason why we succeeded in BBNJ, because we had a united European Union front for 15 years. For 15 years, when we started and when we ended, we've had a united front with all member states behind it. When it comes to the International Seabed Authority, that's not the case yet, and we don't. But, okay, such is life, such is politics, we accept it, we, we try to push, and then that's what discussions, democratic discussions are for. Thank you. Can I very briefly, just a very quick uh, reaction, just to, to point out to you that uh, battery technology is very fastly developing. Uh, there is already the technology to have batteries without any metal involved. It's still in a research stage, so we don't have them yet in our cars, um, but they are around. And the other thing is, because of this very big development, what you see now is by the time we are ready to go into the deep sea, you know, everything is set up and the metals will come up. Those metals are not needed anymore because there's already different uh, metals or even no metals uh, for, for the um, battery. So there's the other aspect as well that we, um, but by then we have, uh, the companies have invested millions and millions of uh, uh, dollars to go deep. So they will continue uh, uh, mining even though the need is uh, not there. And that's what I tried to make clear also in my uh, intervention. Uh, uh, we don't need the metals from the deep sea. And if we are investing and locking ourselves into getting them out there, um, uh, you have a big chance that you get them out there for no demand. So, sorry, just wanted to say. Yeah, because that's how international economic law works, right? Mm -hmm. If you invest, then you need to have a return on investment. I see a lot of questions. Don't, don't worry, I'll get back to you in two seconds. Um, but not yet, but get ready. Um, yeah, so that's how it works. If you invest, you need to have a return on investment. And what um, the tribunals understand right now is that if you cut this, this right to investment, that's something we need to change, um, then you are violating the right to property and the right to and the, the freedom of uh, entrepreneurship. Um, I don't know the right words in English, they're not coming to my mind. But I also wanted to build on that because indeed you talked about an EU uh, consumption, material consumption. And I would say that we need to cap it, actually. It's not only to know where we stand, but it's also to say, according to the studies, the independent studies that we have, we don't need more than this. Then let's organize, not through cap and trades, but through cap and share. We need to organize so that we don't use more than we actually need to safeguard the other planetary boundaries. But I, I guess that's something we'll build on. So prepare your questions. I saw a lot of hands. It's going to be short afterwards. But first of all, I'm going to take Francisca, who is, you don't see her raising her hand, but she's here. And Francisca, your turn. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to see you. Sorry. Hi. Bonsoir. Yes, can you hear me? We can't hear you very well and we can't see you, but... Words? Is it possible? No? Go ahead. Um, because I think the ban or the more, you know, the moratorium, it's an important question which we have been trying to <laughs> tackle around because the seabed authority, you, you have licenses, Germany has licenses, 
and we keep them as long as our objective is one day mining, even if we only do exploration right now. And the seabed authority is built in a way that if you don't use the licenses, you will lose them. And the question is, you know, if Germany loses them, I'm sure there will be some other st member states of the International, uh, International Seabed Authority who would be very happy to pick them up and then really do uh, mining. So it's also the question about we have to reform the International Seabed Authority and think about how this entire mechanism works. That's why we do engage in their negotiations. So it's a complicated system. And I agree that, you know, we have to become so much better in circularity. We have to be uh, much less uh, increasing our requirements for minerals. But unfortunately, for all the new technologies on energy, uh, decarbonization, we need a lot of them. And yes, uh, hopefully we will be able to replace them. Um, and yes, there are batteries who are in the laboratory working without. But for a windmill, for solar, you just need a lot of them and usually you replace it one by one. And it's not just about the EU, it's something like about worldwide. If we all go out of coal and we all go into renewable energies, we will have a huge increase of needs of uh, minerals. So the question is really on, uh, on how we tackle this in general. We need a lot of more research, we need a lot of more circularity. But we also have to be frank about what it needs in the short term. Um, this doesn't lead for me to deep sea uh, bed mining, uh, but this just shows where the interests are and that we have to really build much stronger alliances. And within the EU, we're not yet there. Huh? I'm like, I think there's still a lot of work to be done within even EU member states. And then I think we have to tackle also the seabed authority as such. So just that as uh, maybe uh, some additional words. Thanks a lot, Francisca. That wasn't so easy to hear, but I think that we got the main message. So thanks a lot for that. Okay, so now I know there are a lot of hands, but we won't have the time because of the translators, whom we thank a lot for being here. Um, so I'm going to take four of them. There is one here, two, three, and four, right? Oh, thank you. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. Are there any Belgian representatives in the room? I have a question. After having heard the different countries and our neighbours take a, a position against uh, deep sea mining, what is the Belgian position? Is it changing, especially after the citizens' mobilisation that is going to continue. Furthermore, how can the Commission help uh, citizens, um, help uh, a country uh, like Belgium take a position against deep sea uh, mining? Um, to the representatives of NGOs uh, and those representing uh, the states in the room, why can you please recall uh, why it is important uh, to take a position as fast as possible ahead of the negotiations? Thank you very much for this, the, the organization of this session. Uh, my name is Amin Messel. I, I will represent French youth uh, in the following G7 summit um, that will take place in, in Tokyo. And I, I think I want to push this subject to the ban of the deep sea mining uh, during the negotiation. Um, just first, because, before my question, thank you, Marie, uh, on that the point uh, you you just uh, raised a few minutes ago about about the right to destroy. Oh, sorry, to invest. Um, I think we we have to cut that, and this is justly because it is so complicated to uh, you know retire a right we had given by the past two companies that we just have to 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 take a lot of precaution on just giving new rights to exploit new resources on new area, etc. My, my question is very simple because I, I'm afraid that at the end this is always the same problem, even if North, all the North countries and European Parliament will agree on I don't know, a ban, a big ban on deep sea mining, that will be such a victory. But how, how can we convince and work with, you know, 
most of the time they are soft country, global soft country, to not exploit, to not to not just continue on the development we had given the example for. <laughs> and and how, how can we do that? You know, in 2007, Rafael Correa uh, from Venezuela just proposed to uh, the other country to give money to Venezuela to not exploit oil. And it was not such a success, you know, in the international policies uh, area. So how, how can we do that? How can we convince uh, global South countries that this is not benefit for anyone to do that? Thank you. I think in that case, it's a bit more complicated because it's the southern countries who are lead against the deep sea mining. But your question still still is valid. Yeah, yeah but this, sorry, this is the Nauru state, Island state that just asked for IEMS to the authorization. So I... That's true. No, no, I, I was saying this question is valid still. Uh, behind you, then I will take a first question. Then I will ask if there is a Belgian representative in the room before getting back to the speakers. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. I would have uh, one question and also one comment, if you allow me. Um, so my question would be uh, to um, uh, how uh, uh, can the EU Parliament position feed into the position of member states? So we all know the position of the European Parliament, follow a precautionary approach. How does this relate uh, to the uh, governments and to the council members, for example, at the ISA? What is the communication that is going on there? And uh, then more a comment uh, from my side on uh, how long, uh, when do we know enough? So a bit of background from my side. I'm also a scientist uh, from the Netherlands, also a member of the European Marine Board for uh, the deep sea and healthy oceans. Uh, and uh, when do we know enough? So I want to give one example for the uh, active hydrothermal vents uh, that are studied since uh, the late 70s. And uh, there we know very, very well that um, mining would cause harm and uh, from a scientific perspective, they should be protected. So here, I think from a science perspective, we already have the answer for active fence. Um, when we look uh, for the nodule fields, the situation is a bit more different and difficult because it's larger areas. There was less uh, research going on. Uh, of course, this increased in the last years, luckily, but also the area is larger. But uh, what we do know is, for example, that a nodule is the time scale of like how long an impact would last. So a nodule uh, grows with a, a few millimeters per million years. So it's a, a, yeah. And if you remove this nodule, the um, biodiversity and also the ecosystem process associated with nodule will be lost for millions of years. And this is what we know very, very well. Of course, this is like when we consider only like the place where it happens. So if the area where we move the nodule is very small, like now with test mining, the impact for the global ocean is, of course, limited because the area is small. But in order to be able to predict what are really the impacts, we really need to understand better, for example, the biodiversity in the CC set. Would, uh, so how large could the area be that could be mined uh, in order to uh, yeah, avoid biodiversity loss? And at the moment, we do not know this question, and it will take also... As Patricia already said, uh, several more years, very difficult to say how many, because uh, it's a huge area. There are a handful of scientists, a few hundreds at the moment, uh, that want to solve these questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I'm sorry because now I have the role of moderator, so it's not the nicest role in the, in the room because the time is, is running. So go ahead, but please go fast. And I will ask the same from here, don't worry. Thank you very much. My name is Sean O, and I'm the director of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, which is over 100 organizations working to prevent the start of deep sea bed mining, among other things, to protect the deep ocean. I actually don't have a question. I have two very quick responses to a couple of things that I've heard that I just wanted to throw into the mix, if I may. One is on the question of protected areas, which has come up a couple of times in terms of area-based management tools. Um, as a response to the threat posed by deep seabed mining. And I would just say very quickly that while we have the ambitious target of 30 by 30, um, so 30% 30 of, the, of the ocean protected by 2030, 
The other half of that commitment is to the remaining 70% being sustainably managed. And I think we've heard repeatedly that deep seabed mining, by definition, is not sustainable management of our ocean resources. So that would be my one comment. And the other, the second one, in, in response to the question of a moratorium or, or a ban, um, I, I'd like us to look at the, the other mandate, the second part of the mandate of the International Seabed Authority, which Dr. Verbeek uh, referenced, which is the protection of the deep ocean on, for the benefit of humankind as a whole. Um, and that, that takes us, I think, in part to what Mr. Sadalka said about societal decision making. In addition to scientific certainty, in addition to uh, ensuring that no harm is caused to the environment, we should also be looking for social license um, for an activity that is, that is threatening 50% of this planet, the, the, the deep ocean outside of national jurisdiction. And that, rep that also goes to future generations. What the decisions that we make today, what sort of impacts are they having for future generations? So it's fantastic to see the youth of today taking, taking their voice on this and to hear all of the voices calling for a moratorium. And as we look at that, as you look at that as political decision makers, it's also future generations that, that we're looking and that we're trying to to, to take on this question of do we have the social license, what decisions should we be making on, on their behalf. Thank you very much. I think the room is thanking you. <laughs> um, so it seems there is someone representing Belgium in the room. He's there. Yeah, okay, can you please go ahead? Uh, yes, can you understand me? Yes, so um, I uh, work at the Belgian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and I think our position till date has always been very clear. We've always uh, advocated for a strong legal framework based on strong rules, regulations, and procedures with the precautionary principle uh, central in it, and also based on the uh, most up-to-date latest scientific knowledge. Okay, so that that means that not a position in favor of moratorium, just to say it out loud. Um, okay, I think that's pretty clear. Then I will end the floor. Maybe I will begin by by Mrs. Brantner if she agrees, but I would add a question to those which have been asked, which is that we know that today Belgium, um, but also Portugal, Italy, or, um, or the Netherlands are a bit reticent, I mean, reluctant, we've, we've just heard that, um, to, to move forward. So I'm just wondering how Spain and Germany and France um, could act maybe an open letter or something. What do you think could be done? Um, so, so Mrs. Branta, I hand you the room. I hope you're here. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, and I think the debate about the ban or moratorium is important, but at the same time, for me, the urgency is now to mobilize a majority for moratorium, if I may say so. Um, and that, you know, once we got there, then we see the next step. But we really have to get the moratorium through because otherwise we will get into a very different situation, which might be much more difficult to change afterwards. Um, and I think, you know, what one can do, I think we need a lot of more public awareness in many member states, be it Belgium, the Netherlands. And then, you know, usually you know which companies have an interest. Um, and I think to take governments to fear that if they we lost you for the moratorium they will lose licenses um, and you know there are legal studies out there now that so if we all take it together we will be much safer in terms of not losing licenses because I know that's what governments do worry about and it's correct that we as European governments do worry about it um, so I think you know let's see that we can uh, work on this together um, and hopefully mobilize a bit more and we have been trying to work with our green partners and maybe you from the European Parliament you know you can do your share on uh, calling again on your people in your government and I think it would be great if we achieve to enlarge our coalition on the moratorium 
so far from my side. Thanks a lot. That's quite encouraging. Then I will turn, no surprise, to Mr. Moran, um, a bit with the same questions, but of course all those questions were, were raised by the floor. Sí, but, uh, Just for the two questions that were asked, one on the moratorium and the other on why it is necessary to act, you know, why do we need to take decisions now? So when it comes to building a in large international agreement, it's, 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 it's very tricky. Everyone will need to use an approximation mechanism. This mechanism will allow the moratorium because the moratorium is about supporting the need for more knowledge and more research. And it is relatively more simple to approximate the agreement for people who have different positions um, and push them towards knowledge. Negating knowledge is more difficult to explain compared to other positions that might be a little more controversial. So we need more knowledge to make more solid, strong um, decisions. So we can all agree on the fact that we need more knowledge and research so that we can then make these decisions later. That way we can make a decision. We're saying right now we don't have enough knowledge, which is why we don't want to make a decision. So that's probably the best way of going about this international agreement. The uh, regulation puts in place a timeline which we think is quite questionable. And it's that if in, you know, these infamous two years, if we don't give an answer to something that is in its exploratory phase, to its exploitation phase, the exploitation phase might occur without it actually being needed and so without the regulation being approved. So this is why time is so important and why we need to tackle this kind of approximation mechanism as quickly as possible. We'll turn to you answering the questions, maybe also the questions on, on how, how do we ensure international solidarity um, in that regard. I don't know if the Commission has a standpoint on that, I guess, but... We are always for, um, for trying to lead in the right direction. And... Uh, the key point here is also to see how we can lead, but at the same time, by leading, not be sure, not to, not let's say, to avoid the situation where we go in one direction and the rest of the community doesn't don't follow, whether it's global south or east or whatever, because if we if we um, let's say restrict ourselves to certain activities while others keep on doing what they're doing without any control, the situation might turn out to be for the worse. So definitely we have to mobilize all the possible efforts, all the possible resources, diplomatic, financial, legal, whatever we have, in order to bring everybody to that same, uh, to that same line and that very same direction. It's going to take time, um, even though in many cases it is urgent, as urgent as it can be, but it's going to take time because we uh, don't have the full global consensus on this. But the tendency is there. And again, that's why I say the BBNJ outcome for me was a clear stimulus, clear impetus in, in, in that direction. So I'm very hopeful. I'm optimistic about it. But at the same time, realistic on how long that will take. Not everybody is sharing our values. Not everybody is sharing our principles, including, by the way, on the, on the, on the need to... To, to reduce the resources that we use ourselves, because you know when you talk about and talk to the people in global south, the feeling that that, that they say is that okay, you've lived through a very nice life. Now it's our turn to do it, and that's precisely what leads them to either exploit the resources and sustain them, or sell them out, or sell, sell themselves out. And that's what we want to what we want to offer them a better future to the extent that we are credible by by doing this. So. Uh, by by all means, we need we need that global consensus. We need also a very very strong action by European Union because we are credible here. We are credible here, and we have to get our act together internally as well. That's a very very important, not a trivial action to be to be taken. Thank you. Thank you. So we have room to take initiatives together, don't we? That's good, uh, Monica.
So, um, about the Global South and the request for um, living a nice life as we have been doing already for a long time, um, um, I think it's clear um, that we also should not make the same, same mistakes that we have done in the past. Uh, Global South should leapfrog, right? rather than replicating all the mistakes uh, uh, we have done. Um, deep sea mining will have uh, a lot of impact um, and it will probably not bring much to a country, to be honest, just to a few companies who are going to mine. So <clears throat> I don't think that is where um, uh, the main benefit will be. Um, I think we can conclude already from today to see that um, Compared to last year, there has been a huge leap in support for uh, a position against deep sea mining now, whether it's a moratorium, a precautionary pause or a ban. Um, it is clear that um, uh, there's a lot of discussion going on. Uh, it is clear that uh, right now we just had the whole world agree on the fact that, yes, we do need to protect biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Um, and we do have now a framework to go about that uh, protection. Um, the ISA does have the role to also protect against uh, a human the seabed, against human activities. Um, and yet they are at a point where we see this year it may go ahead. So this is really crunch time. Therefore, it's hugely important that there are uh, states stepping up and saying, hey, wait, let's not do this. Again, I want to point back to the late 80s where this happened for mining in Antarctica. Uh, let's uh, look at that example. Let's um, uh, push for that example to happen again with the deep sea so that um, this will not go ahead, not this year, not next year, and as far as I'm concerned, not in the next thousand years. Um, because again, as I said, um, we don't want it, we don't need it, and it's really not worth the risk. Okay, so for final remarks, um, I'm going to continue saying what I already said, and is that we cannot protect what we don't know. And not only management, but also decisions that it has been said, decisions should be made based on solid, robust knowledge, and that robust knowledge comes with robust science. And we need a lot more time for this knowledge and for this, uh, for this um, science. So we need a lot more time for taking um, decisions, any kind of decision that can, uh, can have longer effect in our future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Mrs. Esquete. Thanks a lot to all of you for having been here. Um, I think, and I'm saying that before, the concluding words, but that you'll be able to, because there were still a few hands, but to follow up the discussion because we organized a pool <laughs> that is here waiting for you. So, of course, you can't stay all night in the European Parliament. I also want to tell you this, uh, but we have a good half hour uh, after if you want to, to raise your questions towards the speakers. Um, donc, je suis censée faire la conclusion. Je vais la faire euh, de manière... I'm supposed to do the conclusion, so I'll try and be as quick as possible because we have interpreters with us who have working hours that need to be respected. So, sorry about the delay. I will try to make sure that we don't run over time. Thank you, everyone. We have seen this evening that there is true mobilisation on behalf of civil society as well as states. Uh, we've seen this. We have an alliance of um, interparliamentary groups, so everyone is mobilising. But at the same time, the majority of states in the world remain to be convinced. So we need to start by encouraging them. We'll start with Belgium, of course, and... Um, mineral extraction or mining is going to start in September, so time is running out. I would like to, if any message is going to be broadcast this evening, it is the following. It is that we are all living beings. We depend on oceans. 
we come literally from the oceans and we cannot continue to behave like we own oceans, like we can manipulate oceans, like we can harm them and that there won't be any uh, repercussions. We are dependent on the health of the ocean and if Approach One Health is uh, on trend at the moment, then that means that we need to involve, uh, that rather we need to change uh, the way that human societies behave. And it is here that the EU has a role uh, to play. Within the EU, we uh, account for 8% of the global population. So if we look at planetary limits, there are nine... If we want to respect um, planetary limits, we need to um, play our part. So we should only account for 8%. We need to look at the equal treatment of all inhabitants of this, pa uh, um, of this po population. If we were to respect this rule, then uh, we would only account for 4%. We have companies that represent capital and our consumption um, takes up a larger share of the impact on ecosystems. So we really have to lead by example and we mustn't uh, mine these deep seabeds. Monica spoke earlier. Um, about the fact, and I agree, that Europe needs to have a, a, a ceiling, a limit. There is something called the donut theory that I'm sure you will know about. So we need to adopt an environmental treaty that will join other um, EU legislations. And this is a subject that we should maybe speak about with other member states at another time. But I would also like to underscore the fact that the solutions to the crises that we are currently experiencing can't be the same as those that uh, cause the crises in the first place. I'd like to ring the alarm bell here that very regularly at international summits, whether it be the latest COP summit or the latest summit on biodiversities or rainforests, but often proposals that are put on the table are, as I said earlier, the thingification, the manipulation of living things. We think that we can save the planet by um, opening up these new uh, uh, limits. There can be financial limits, for example, or continuing uh, patents, patenting living beings or living things. So these are compensation mechanisms that we see everywhere. We can see this uh, when it comes to carbon. And then people are imposing physical barriers on uh, mining and production. And now this is happening in seabeds. And there are these predatory uh, companies, and this is why we are all here today. Now, I know that not everyone shares this opinion with me, but growth. We have this obsession with growth. People are constantly seeking out uh, profit. People want to use these metals and these fossil fuels. But this is not going to save the planet, nor human beings, nor uh, harmony between human beings. Many people asked us, what can we do faced with all this scientific uncertainty? And I would argue that this question has been asked since 1912, and we have answered it um, on multiple occasions, and it is the precautionary principle, and M Mr Moran said this, we mustn't act when we don't know the scope of the effect of what we want to do. So the precautionary principle is the same for these seabeds. They are fragile places that represent biodiversity, and so they must be protected. There's the laws of economy versus the laws of nature, but... Without concrete evidence, we must continue to mobilise. So before leaving this evening, I would like to, first of all, make a special thanks to um, everyone here in this room who have been carrying out these mobilisations. I'd like to thank Sandrine Polti and all uh, and other people and organisations involved this evening. I'd like to thank Patricia Esquete, Monica Verbeck, 
Kasutis Sadowskas. Um, et, et bien sûr, les représentants. And uh, representatives from states who were present with us this evening, Olivier, uh, Hugo, and Francisco. I'd also like to thank Caroline at Rose for being here beside me, um, whether it be for this struggle or others, and also to the CIRICA intergroup for organizing this conference. And finally, these events couldn't happen without people who were never spotlighted, and those are the organizers. Um, I will n like to give them a round warm of applause, and I'd like to thank the interpreters, Maria, Elena, David, Pasquale, Jesse, Ellen, and Roxanne, and Lois, Filipino, and Bernard, who are sat behind their computers and who have overseen the excellent organization of this conference. So thank you for being here with us this evening. Thank you. Oh,